run by women in the Family Resource Centre based in St Michael's in State Dublin. She has worked tirelessly as a community activist on issues of equality and social justice. Rita has been a member of St. Michael's Estate Regeneration Team since its inception and is a regular contributor to national media, having appeared as a panelist on Primetime, Frontline, and tonight with Vincent Brown. And we're delighted to have such a, a committed and, and vocal activist with us today. Thank you very much, Rita Baker. Okay, I'm delighted to be here. As you're saying, it's lovely uh, coming down on the train. It's just lovely having been on the train in ages. And it's good to get a day out from the community as well, because sometimes you're just embedded and you can't see the wood from the trees sometimes. And then you realise, you know, on the train and out in the fields, and it isn't as bad. It doesn't look as bad. But anyway, I am a, a community activist, and uh, I have been working in St. Michael's Estate, which is the community where I work. A lot of people think I live there, but I work there. And I've been working there for the past 25 years. I went as a student and I never got out after that. Um, so I've also uh, been a volunteer in the Dublin Simon community for 11 years and I was a full-time volunteer living with the homeless there. And I also am a volunteer in my own community which is in the Liberties, which are similar to that to a uh, similar working class community. So, I do have a field of community expertise, and as I say, um, it is important to have analysis. I think people think community development and community projects and all that, but the work of community development uh, and as a community worker is about promoting and producing positive change in our society. It's, it's not just a charitable response, it is about you know, challenging oppression. It's about supporting uh, groups to take control of their own lives because a lot of the communities that we work with, a lot of people are very disempowered and they don't know how to go about things. And you have to actually pass on skills and, and teach people how actually to, to fight for their lives. So empowering people through uh, skills and knowledge uh, to participate equally in decision making I am going to go into our own case history, but I do think that uh, that kind of analysis, that kind of thinking about how community work gets done has to be from an analysis where people are being oppressed. I'll just go to the next little one. So, more or less the tools and principles of community development is really about the collective. When you work with the individual and you begin with individuals where they may have problems or you know, they might need a different kind of help or communities. Uh, but in the end of the day, what you're working towards is a togetherness and a, real, a way of challenging systems in a, in a together. So it's a collective where social work kind of deals with the problem, patches it up, it doesn't pass it out, where collectivity is about the more you unite, the more chances you have in women. It's important that it's participatory, and not participatory in a way that um, is tokenistic, like when we were in the challenge of regeneration, we ensured all through the way that the tenants were at all the tables, but they weren't there without the skills to be there. We had to teach them the skills to be there. It's about an empowering, letting people believe in themselves and believe in their communities, um, I believe that they have a right to be in the society. And it's about a raising of consciousness, it's so that you do it through local education and making sure, as you say, that people have the knowledge and the skills and that they ask why, like that. You know, why am I poor? <coughs> why am I blamed of being poor? You know, what is that about? Um, and about, it's about uh, the values and, you know, like there's nothing neutral where I am, I stand with the poor. That's who I want to fight for. I'm not standing with the rich. I want to. So my value is about people, and it's about people at the very bottom of our society. So there you could say I'm maybe the toolkit. So you're yeah, working towards collective. You're involving people. You're empowering people. And then you go to the wider analysis, which is what's happening um, in our society. And that is that within our very structures, uh, it, it's by, they are violent. 
because as long as you have people at the top and you have people at the bottom, and we now have more people at the top because only recently in the uh, in the most recent recent rich uh, 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 index, we've had. 68 billionaires in Ireland, and 68 billionaires is a, is a lot of money. And of that, in that index, I think there was something like in the last year, 300 new millionaires, I think millionaires, that made money in the last year. While at the same stage, our people, our people are being told that they have to live in houses uh, or uh, live in, uh, in flats where storage is coming up to you in the bath when you're washing yourself or that you just don't have, you keep the children out of school because you just don't have it to, to give them the things they need to have for school or that, you know, that they've taken the choices in terms of all the people that are heating, whether they have heating, whether they have food or the different things. You know, so in our society, we are acting violently to a large part of the population. So structural violence is about poverty, it's about exclusion, it's about having no control, it's about feeling terrible parents. And if there is prejudice, and there's prejudice that's, that's, um, that the media stores up as well, where you know, like you have welfare, uh, welfare scroungers, uh, uh, ghettos, uh, these people don't want to work. There's, how do they know, like, and why and whose stories get out there in the media? Because, you know, you might have seen a few of us on Vincent Brown for a few times, but you don't get asked that often to be the voice in those spaces to argue those particular things. So the prejudice of the media, the prejudice of a class as well, because we aren't talking about, is about very much working class cultures and communities and underclass. So if we are involved in community work, it has to be work that isn't afraid to be challenging those structures and, and challenging oppression, because when you're oppressed, you're being kept down all the time. And if you've been kept down all the time, it gives you some sort of a message that you're not worthy of being here. But everybody is worthy of really looking for an equal society. We have to always be fighting for those people at the bottom. And there's people come more nearer to the bottom now uh, than, you know, like the, the divide is, is, you know, between wealth and poverty is really, really uh, widening. So I'll go to my next little one. So I wanted to talk about St. Michael's Estate uh, to the community in Dublin. Uh, and its land is very, very old and very, very rich land in all different kinds of ways. So, uh, go back to around the 1890s, um, Richard Barrett was, uh, was an English barrack, um, based, as I said, in Inchicore, Dublin. And uh, in the 1940s, during the First World War, a lot of the soldiers that came to live on um, Close Square, they were very much working class soldiers. and. You know, in some of the history papers, you know, their wives and that were very poor, and they come for a year and they, they did their training on Kill Square, and then they were sent out to the war and shot. And that really, when you think about it, um, you think about it in the American wars or that, who gets sent to war? It's not the people at the top get sent to war, it's the people that come from our communities, the soldiers. So they lived there on the barracks, and the barracks wasn't a great. Um, you know, like it wasn't in the okay in the in the sergeants or the what you call the generals' quarters might be different. But on the on the barracks itself, it was quite poor for those soldiers and their wives and their families to be living in. So there's a sense of poverty on the land from very early on. And then in the 1916 rising in Ireland, um, the when, when they went to O'Connell Street, the, the, the they gathered the men. Uh, a lot of the, the leaders were brought to, to, kill, to Richmond Barracks where they were put into the gymnasium and along with that was uh, Countess Mark which was held in the gymnasium. And there was about 2,300 people held in the gymnasium just before they went to be court-martialed. So they were taken from the gymnasium across to it was kind of like a little place at the back of, of the barracks wall 
and there they were court martialed and they were marched down from uh, from the barracks right down to Kilmainham Jail. And on the way down, uh, they said that, that there was thrown tomatoes and all the kind of things, and they were taken into the barracks in, into Kilmainham Jail, and um, a number of them were shot in Kilmainham Jail. Now Connolly wasn't held on the land at that time. But those people were fighting for equality too. They were fighting for all the things that we continue to fight about. And so they were on that land. Sorry about the next little bit. So uh, in 1922, the army, um, the Irish army moved into Richmond. The, the English moved out and the Irish army took over. And then on up to about 1945, uh, the state was given it. So Dublin City Council was given the barracks and what they turned it into, there was one part of the barracks where, as it said, it had been the general's quarters or the um, lieutenants or whoever is higher in the army's quarter. And they were okay, but these were the housing um, that was where people went to live. So people went to live there and it was called Kyo Square, right? And people who ended up living in Kyo Square um, were people who couldn't pay their money in the tenement. Now if you lived in a tenement in Dublin City, that was like you were at the low level, but if you couldn't pay your money there, you'd go there or you'd end up maybe in St. James, it's just for Mass Call in the Union. I don't know, there's a whole history to that. So really, again, like you had the poverty of soldiers, you had to fight for the equality, you had Kyo Square. So Kyo Square, um, and a lot of people have warm feelings about having lived, you know, some of the rooms were split with curtains and all that, and uh, have warm feelings about living uh, in Kyo Square. And if you ask a lot of older people, like Kyo Square was known as one of the biggest slums uh, in Dublin. But anyway, so we move on then to, um, 1969. So the, this state decided that they were going to build, they needed to build housing, so they decided to build what's called Ballymone. Now, everybody probably knows Ballymone in Dublin, it's on the outskirts, and they built about 2,000 homes in Ballymone, and they were 14 stories high. And uh, like this was about the new town, new futures, and all that. In the end of the day, Ballymone. Uh, because the social mix wasn't a really big social mix or the investment wasn't put into Ballymun. And a lot of the people living in Ballymun ended up being very poor. But anyway, they decided to pull down Kyo Square and build um, St. Michael's Estate. Now these are eight stories here. There was eight stories, four stories, four stories and two stories where the older uh, people lived. So when they built these now, they built these back in 1969. Now they're a bit rough there because that's life on them. Um, these flats uh, were going to be built at 14 stories, but people say on this side in Connolly Avenue, they said uh, we're not having 14 stories, which was a good, a good win it was because it brought them down to eight stories. And then when people lived in them, they called them streets in the sky because they were like streets in the sky. And as time went on, uh, life went on within the blocks. But they had heating, so people dried their clothes on the floors, really good heating. Uh, they were really, really well built at the time, uh, very strong. People who had come to live in them, a lot of them were leaders, tenant leaders from the National Tenants Organisation and stuff. And they had open space, so they weren't blocked in. There was a lot of open space because it was a French kind of uh, design. And uh, it was lovely at the time, and there was a lot of community. And then we go again. And then uh, the state decided um, in around 1975-80 to offer what was called a surrender grant to people who wanted to come back to living on the land. Because in the end of the day, Irish people, they're not really used to living in the sky, uh, where that might happen in Europe or that point. They live on the ground, live in the land. So a lot of the people who could and did took the surrender grant and they got houses like in places like uh, Valley Ferm, which is close in Oregon, and uh, it's a place like Valley Ferm, and they got places like Clundalk and Artalan. Uh, and so what you had to happen here was that the leaders, really good leaders, tenant leaders, we knew what it was like to fight. My mother was a national tenants organizer, 
Um, she's 90, she continues to be a tenant dog, and now she doesn't give up money for her, but they were part of that uh, international tenants organisation that fought the fight about rents. You know, do I, I think what's happening in England now, they're putting on the bedroom tax and all that kind of stuff. But they fought about uh, prices being put on every room, and they had about maybe 70,000 out to the streets, and uh, they saved the rent and they won the rent strike. So those kinds of leaders then were leaving. Um, St. Michael's, um, and then it, it uh, created kind of open spaces where uh, the next part of the government's policy was uh, that single parents, uh, now we were holding on to the children, we weren't sending them off to Australia, America, Orphanage, Golden Bridge, or what. we were now keeping our children, and they were entitled to not get houses, but flats. So what began then was a change of the, the demography, is that the word for it? So they changed in the context of uh, a lot more single parents were being placed in St. Michael's. And uh, so traditional families, um, like there was a lot more uh, families being placed there. And then as the flats came on again, uh, we didn't really have a lot of control over the allocations policy as to who was being sent to. And that's a really essential part of any community, to have a say as to who comes in and lives in your community or destroys your community. So these two things had big, um, had big uh, impacts on the likes of St. Michael's and a lot of other communities about that were, um, I'll move to my next little one. So then let's say around 1985, where in 1970 you had new flats, you had up to about 19, 80, 81 or two things began to go a bit um, off the wall. So you had um, you had drugs coming in, all right, um, but the drugs were underground at that stage, and um, there had been uh, marches in the city to concern parents against drugs in the city. And Michaels would have been at that time involved in them marches to try stop drugs from coming in. But gradually, what the state does, it doesn't take care really of its spaces and uh, so the, the flats began to really de deteriorate and the lifts got broken. So you could be up on the eighth store and you'd have to drag your pram with your children and your messages and be up on the eighth story and get there. And then because the way the flats were built, you had kind of landings where other flats you might stand out on your balcony you're looking over the balcony where it is when you can go inside and so you were in out of the rain or what so gangs gathered and um, so you can see that the flats are going down in this stage so um, yeah so there you are so we began uh, back in around 1985 we began a refurbishment campaign and a campaign just to have your maintenance carried out uh, we did manage to get the flats um, painted at the time and some of the things fixed but again by I think I can have another one and uh, Bertie Heron I, I continue to say his name Bertie Heron came out to the estate he was a TD at the time and he was the finance minister and uh, he promised us I was caught in the lift room on St Michael's estate he couldn't get out man. and he promised <laughs> <laughs> he promised a million to St Michael's <laughs> under open renewal, which the estate has never seen. So we had to keep marching on. So let me next little bit. So in Dublin, by 1984, the drugs in Dublin uh, really escalated. And people, uh, they were taking their own power in some communities. And what they were doing was they were pushing out their pushers, and they were pushing out those, who some of them were their children, uh, who were taking the drugs and they were pushing them out and some communities were more vulnerable than others and the likes of St. Michael's Estate, the likes of Fatima Mansions, the likes of Teresa's Gardens, Dolphin House, Old Ebony, they were areas where um, the, the people who were being pushed out actually came to and they came to it for two reasons, they came to it because uh, there was only two chemists in the whole of Dublin that was dispensing methadone. So that was a chemist on Dolphin's Barn, which is in the Dublin A area, and a chemist in, in, in 
in um, on Emmet Road, Mr. Bowles. So people could go in there and get a bottle of antidote that size, and then they'd come back over to the flats and they'd go up on the stairway, and they'd sell it, and then you'd have the heroin, and then you had. So it became just a woeful place, really, to live in. It was just not a rose garden, as uh, one of the tenants said to me once, but this wasn't a rose garden, uh, you know, because when you went in at night, you didn't know who was out in your land, and people began to sleep on the land, and they'd throw the needles, so you couldn't let your kids out, you couldn't let your kids down. If you went to the shop, uh, you know, people had to get gates on the doors, or get somebody to mind their home while they'd gone to the shop. And there was no way for people to be allowed to be left living. And the state still didn't come in. All the TDs walked away. The police, when they did come, one time the police came and they, it was like South Africa, they were going around to the state with, with Alisation dogs, you know, and the Farm Bazaar Centre said, here, uh, you know, let, let's back off here. This is a community and that. And they'd sit on the roof and they'd watch. And people were paranoid and there'd be, oh, it, it was just a life. So for about four years, the life really got very, very hard. So people at that stage, in, in, um, people at that stage just had witnessed just too much. Um, so there was a lot of water under the bridge. People were very oppressed really oppressed and uh, like they had been silent witnesses of what was going on and also there would have been a lot of intimidation and that like if you knew what was going on you couldn't tell it or you'd be caught you know you'd be or your child or whatever and uh, so people just got worn down and a lot of people began to move out um, to anywhere really they just couldn't live within it so we, we were in action, St. Michael's Action Group. So what we said was um, we'd go to the Department of the Environment and we'd seek some funding that we could actually do a survey. As now, when I look back, I think it was the wrong time, but um, to ask people exactly what did the people want and to do it officially through an official you know, researcher and surveyor. So what did happen was, 64% of the people who had just got up to that uh, just said they wanted to do Now, a lot of them would, would have been on their way somewhere else. They were, you know, like it was like a train, you got on the train in Limerick, but you were going to Cork. So, a lot of them who didn't really embrace or own the community uh, wanted out and gone. 33% of them who were the lifers, who even knew, you know, when they how bad it was, but they didn't want to go from their community. And it was about a three percent that didn't give a damn what happened to us. So we went on, we, we took it and we went to the next day. So we managed to get um um okay I might if you do go to the next slide I think and then I'll come back to that one. Okay, so I think it's nine years, go back nine years, three, six, two oh oh four. In the two it was 1998. So in 2004, we managed to build 101 units on two pieces of land on each side of the estate. One of them, where Dublin City Council had bought land off the Sisters of Mercy for social housing, and they bought land off the Christian Brothers. So you could say these were the very lucky tenants because these got, you know, in order to de to demolish the four street three blocks. You had to move people off. So uh, in April, April uh, nine years ago, people uh, got their new homes. So they were off the four street towers, or there might have been some who didn't want to go and went to Moretz and other people came on. So that was 51 units of two bedroom, three bedroom, and four bedroom. Uh, and over here, these, this is the senior citizens. So the senior citizens uh, were very lucky and they got to pick their homes, and it's a gorgeous little site, and then we got as well, these are gold standard, we got a, little, um, a dinner house built for them and all. Now we, we, the regeneration, were involved in every aspect of this, so I'll just go back to the plan. So having built the first phase of that, um, we then had sat down in a room for two years, and we built uh, a plan, uh, I think it was that plan, didn't do that many plans. 
this plan, right? So this plan, if this plan had been went through and they paid the money, Michael's estate would be built, it would be just a community like any other community. So two years, we knew when the, we, we knew when the colours of the doors, the slates on the roof, the presses that were in, we knew everything. It was uh, 70 first-time buyers, there was um, 170 something local authority and first-time buyers and then there was some duplexes anyway. There was a family resource centre, uh, there was open space and something for youth to spend and that. Now that would have only cost about I think, 63 million or something at the time, I can't remember. But anyway, so that was, that was the first plan. We sat down in a room in September that year, ready to look at how do we implement this plan, how do we get this plan now on the road, and we, the Dublin City Council official of the day said, we have bad news uh, for you, which now that was very terrible news, uh, that the Department of the Environment have rejected your plan. And we had worked with councillors, officials, community, tenants, to develop this plan, so everybody owned it. And they said what they were going to do was do a public-private partnership. This was all in the time of the day, so that they had found a way to make money out of building. So they closed the door on us. Now I have to tell you, we were devastated, because we just couldn't believe that the state could do that to you after the state were committed to deliver it. And what we couldn't believe either was that the state all of a sudden went over uh, and was on their own side. So do you know, you see, you had a real changeover. So they got this seller here, and he was this big architect, and they closed the door on us, right? And this architect was off to build this jelly bean plan, right? Now, so we were 300 and something uh, units. What we wanted to do was meet what we lost. We didn't want to lose the amount of housing, social housing. We feel that we belong to people who was entitled to social housing. We gave them a bit in 70 units, because we had got the hundred, and you know, we had done all our own. But anyway, this one, they went ahead with this one. And at this stage, we go up to, that was in September, so it took us to November before we got up off our knees. God came out with a shop. We had loads of meetings, you know, the plan we delivered, about the plan we wanted, that was our mantra. So we, we got working with um, a, a communications company, who helped us uh, devise um, a campaign, right? So we got involved in this campaign. This was for this plan, right? And uh, we had a big foot, and uh, we were saying, stop stamping on the community, deliver us our plan. We called 3,000 houses in Inchicore, and everybody gave us their signature. People were devastated with what we had to do to us, and we wrapped it up. And we went into the city manager's office in a big, beautiful box and gave him 3,000 signature. And we had all these um, t-shirts on. So we stood outside the city hall and we were on the board as well at that time. And then we went in our t-shirts into the room that was um, unveiled in this plan, right? So this plan was 850 units, all, all high-rise units. And we, so even if they had 70 social housing in it, it was all going to be for sell as apartments. And the benefits to the area was we were, people were being asked to take down towers and they were building towers. So there was no way we were going to let that happen to communities. So we kept on the campaign and uh, we got the, all, all, mm -hmm. we got all of the as I said, behind our backs. And then the TDs saw that they weren't going to win. So then they came to our side and went into the city council on the night that they uh, were voting this in. And it was the first time in years upon years that the whole 52 councillors voted with us, the community. Now the officials were ready to kill us off, right? Kill us off at that stage. But, um, and it was very interesting how the media treated us because when, when the media should have been saying, the 
Yeah. Irish made to meet you that we pay in time tonight and should have been saying a community won yeah, I know their rights. What they did was they interviewed uh, Ben and Kenny and John Fitzgerald and all of them and they said them community people have put St. Michael's estate back ten years. But they have put St. Michael's estate back ten years, right? So anyway, they were living with us, right? But we knew that we weren't going to be able to win the public private partnership fund. At some stage, we had to be able to go in there. Fatima was being built, because Fatima is the only public private partnership development that has been built uh, since and in all this. And they were just lucky they got over to take. But anyway, so, Plum City County had to come back to us, the three generation board. And they came back with their tails between their legs, and they were feminists. But well, we had to go back into the room because we still had 14 acres of land to be developed and um, somehow or another we had to get it developed. So what happened then was uh, they said, look, there's no going back for the public-private partnership. So we went into rooms, it was like the, the peace agreement in the dark. We did negotiations, so we figured out what we wanted. So uh, 165 local authorities and uh, we wanted out of, within whatever their build was, we wanted that. We wanted 10% of the site to be made for disability because we wanted to kind of pioneer a way that if you were building a new site that you would include people with disability in it. Uh, we wanted a youth cafe, a new family resource centre, a new library, uh, a park, uh, playgrounds within all these things. So, and we wanted... Uh, we wanted a six million social agenda, which we then pushed them far towards a nine million social agenda. So anyway, uh, it was agreed that we had a framework now to go into this one now. So uh, then they said to us, you can't be on the, uh, the, the, what was it? the assessment committee of the developers. And we said, no. We have to be on the assessment committee, and they went down for about 10 months, and we said we want three people on the assessment committee. But they said you don't have the expertise, because communities don't have the expertise of finance, of, um, of what's it, architecture and all that. But communities have the expertise of living in their community. They know their land, they know what works, they know what doesn't work, and they have been through two plans at this stage. We were well architects, we've been able to build them as well at this stage. But anyway, we won. So John Bissett and we got, when I talked about participation, we got the participation of a tenant, which they were very worried to would break the confidentiality. So Tasha uh, put on her black suit and she had her briefcase and she went in with John. And they didn't break the confidentiality. They didn't break the confidentiality to us. And there was three three possible, out of five, there was three possible really good uh, developments. But they picked, Trump City Council um, and the Department of Finance picked Bernard McNamara. Uh, so Bernard McNamara was the developer. Bernard McNamara knew how to work the system. And they, they, like, when you really look back, and you look back at greed, uh, like the, the, the department was greedy and the council was greedy, Ben McNamara was very greedy anyway because well, he was doing what he does. So they gave him St. Michael's estate. They gave him, I think I can go on a bit there. Uh, no, that's sorry, I even need that. I love that picture. Um, so another one, we might come back to that in a minute. Yeah, so they gave him St. Michael's estate. They gave him, this is O'Devany Gardens. This is up on just right beside the park. And they gave him Dominic Street. To eat. They gave him a, a piece of land down in Sean McDermott Street and a piece of land up in uh, Infirmary Road. Now, I'll go back to my picture for a minute. So, uh, all of this land, which we call the promised land, that's what we picture, isn't it? Uh, was uh, to be built uh, now at this stage. We sat in for uh, nearly 11 months tweeting all the, the designs, because we had a design group. We got the agreement, we got six million agreement for a social agenda. We had all of that. 
We signed off in St. Michael's on the 14th of January, 2008. We shook hands and we went down for dinner with them down in the Hilton, the Dublin City Council. I swear to God, God bless this, but I was in the tile all night. <laughs> I tell you, it was an omen. It was an omen. I, so, boy, there was things coming in then, you know, it was getting a bit long. We were shaking off on it. So by March you were saying, why, what's not, what isn't happening? And he was saying, McNamara is saying there's toxins on the land. But he always knew there was toxins on the land. There was a barracks on the land. The, the lead um, or the petrol or whatever went into the soil and that. So he was trying. Then, then they had this plan for bigger rooms. And Rock Dublin City Council had agreed to pay him the money. So it wasn't that. But what was going on in this society was that Bernard McNamara and a few others <coughs> knew what was coming on the 20th of September. They knew that the bubble was forced and, and at this stage. So on the 19th of May, 2008, and you could say that these five communities were the five communities that were the very forced uh, to have the impact of that bubble burst. Uh, they put out, they put letters through the door before we even turned the board. People's hopes and dreams, I go on, uh, now, the, the, the hopes and dreams of the people uh, was just devastated, right? So, well, well, the force, we, we had to, we had to begin protesting again. So what happened here was, uh, these were, just very raw response. It was just the communities just came, they just gathered outside of the city council. And then we began to organise the communities a bit more and we did it through the yard kind of so that was the death of our hope and dream. When we got to the uh, city council we banged pots and showed but we did a death march across Cape Street Bridge. And then we'd be told Balloons Day into Doomsday and it was about twenty two of us uh, where a, a grant, a small large grant, we hired out the, the funeral car. That's the plan, St. Michael's is staying there. And uh, we, we went down to the Department of the Environment with Molly Bloom and them, and we left in the, um, the tree letters from the tree communities. And then John was Leopold uh, Bloom, and he read out your big tree to the communities. We, we got great art, uh, art protest. <laughs> then, uh, then we said we wouldn't go away because our campaign was we are not going away with. So we uh, said to the Lord Mayor, uh, you know, in your hands rest our future. You're getting the key to your home. So when are we getting the keys? That was the three communities to our home. So we were out there with that. Next one. So that, that was kind of like, and then we said, well, right, you walk in their shoes. That was another part. And so we kept them going. We wouldn't, every council meeting there was, we were outside with something. And then we did Scrooge, you know, we did uh, John Gormley with Scrooge, so this is a post defense class uh, degree. So all we want for Christmas are our prompts and homes. So we weren't going anywhere. So, and then we went outside Anglo Irish Bank. Uh, like social welfare for the rich. This is before anybody was going outside down to Irish, but we made up the, the Golden Circle and we went outside of the Anglo Irish Bank uh, saying we want our homes, we want the land, we, we weren't giving up. And so then on the next one, he, uh, John Gormley got fed up with us and uh, he said he came out in the car and he called us, uh, he called the board together and we went in. So they gave us two acres of the site, uh, which has been developed. It's near at the, at the, at the piece of development. So uh, I'll try to keep going there. So he gave us that. So, so these are 75 <coughs> units we won at this stage uh, in the land fight. Because we wouldn't go away and we wouldn't give up and we wouldn't stop. So these are absolutely beautiful. So there's 10 new homes and there's 65 uh, three bedroom, two bedroom and some one bedroom. Our childcare centre is in there as well, the family resource centre. Uh, and then just recently they began pulling down the last tower. So <coughs> another bit. And so this is our childcare centre for the future, because this is where the family resource centre was working in for you. Now I think I'm going to bring me, I've only lit three, I know you saw I've got to run somewhere. I've lit the three minute video, right? 
that I just want to put on because it gives you a bit of sense of the work of the Family Resource Centre. Some of it's work, right? So I just wanted to give you a little bit from the, the people piece. So we've been working every day for the last 25 years, <laughs> every day stay. Millie will be going into one of them new homes. There was four mummy who was um, together, it was a ten. That's a new little sense of interval. And we have got burned, burned out last June, and so it's been very, very hard struggle for the family resource centre. Um, and I, yeah, we go on to the next one. So it just goes to the people living in communities, children are aged in communities, a lot of those people who live in those communities. Uh, our poorer children. So what's happening then, uh, I just wanted to take it's just another little level because I just want to talk about what's happening to communities and communities development. Um, because it, like, if I just take the area of the canals communities, uh, in the last four years, um, just that's only a small step. You've got to think of Ireland as a whole in terms of the policies. We've lost... Um, We've lost a uh, regional youth service in the in the area. We've lost uh, 
the intercultural centre, which was like a lot of new communities have come to live in Inchicore and Canals area. They closed that down in September. We lost three major community development workers between Dolphin House, O'Devany and Michaels. Uh, we've lost the music for me program for 200 children. Uh, they've cut back in the drugs task force, they've cut back in the partnership drugs and consent, they've, uh, they've cut back through all the programs. Um, that's just a very small piece and that little piece don't go to the next communities and the next ones. On a national level they've closed down the community development program, 165 projects. They're heading towards alignment this Christmas around putting partnerships and that maybe into the councils. Um, they're just, it's just, um, out there they're ripping the hearts out of communities. So we as, as community leaders have to think what can we do to try at least collectivise the, the, the protest. So we have built what's called a spectacle of defiance and hope. This was at the last big march. Um, we wanted to do it in a somewhat different way because um, to get people who don't normally come out. And as I was saying, like, who is hoarding? You know, go back to the bigger analysis around structural violence. Who is hoarding and who is paying the price? And it's not the bankers and it's not the developers. It's families, it's migrants, it's children, it's older people, it's disabled, travellers, youth, men, small business and areas that have been degenerated. The likes of O'Delany is not getting built. Our spirit and our fight is continuing on. But O'Devany, they managed to devastate, so they're not building O'Devany at the moment. I don't think they're going on with St. Teresa's Cairns, and they've cut a lot of regenerate projects. So there is a need to, to change the policies of austerity because there will be nothing left uh, in the context. So what we did was like uh, what has been lost. So what is being lost is the infrastructure, which was built up over something like 20 to 30 years. And it doesn't matter what people say. You have to have a professional infrastructure as well. Professional in struggle that challenges oppression. Frontline services are all just getting wiped out. Youth projects, uh, seed YSB, that's a, have just come after a huge cuts just uh, about seven weeks ago. So the youth has to now rise up. As I said, the community men have gone, uh, the cuts in the, in the childcare programs. Uh, after school of general. So, you know, they're being lost. The Combo Poverty Agency, social housing, they haven't put much into it. Um, and when they not, not only did they uh, move all the community development projects into partnerships, but they lost 14 major projects, and there were 14 projects that were like our own, that were always vicing about the injustices, and they got rid of them. So they can get rid of you if they want to get rid of you in a little bit. So the spectre of defiance and hope, we took to the streets now about four times. We wear red, um, we always try to make it creative. At the present moment, we made groups of austerity uh, and hope, and we're working towards um, uh, putting on the, the, austerity, the songs of austerity in the projects art soon. But what it does mean is that we all have a duty, any of us who believe or want to fight for the poor, we have a duty to not sit back, but actually to do things. So I know I'm tying this out. So what we need to do is we need to upset the, the logic of the privilege. You know, we just can't accept the logic that there is no alternative. There are alternatives, and they're not doing the alternative because those who are vested interest can get to the politicians a lot more than us because it's far easier to go after the weaker. So we need to, we need to upset their takers of privilege. We need to expose the government, and that is using the media in the best ways we can, and getting the media to work for us as well. Uh, exposing what they're doing, you know, like, we need to resist, you know, resist them, no matter what they're at, resist them. And, you know, to organise, and to organise collectively, to have a voice collectively, you know, you don't get, there with one person saying that you have to have that, that building of organisation. We need to take to the streets, as I said, be defiant. Like, we need to move to another level, I think, of defiance. And we need to be able to say to people, you know, we have to have hope. We've got to stay in here and, and continue to fight and identify who the enemy is. Uh, 
Um, we have to envision a better society because if this is the society that we have, it's the society we want, you know, like, might as well all give up. And we have to remember that it's the long game, that history isn't made overnight. Like, you just have to see how long it took us even to just get them two acres done. Like, there was something like 11 years and there wasn't a sod torn on to my used to It's taken 15 years to get the last tower taken down. Do you know what I mean? So when you're in the struggle, you, you kind of want it all sorted, but it's the long game. And we have to start, as even Nelson Mandela, you know, he, he was always in for the long game, when you see. And it is hard work, and it does take discipline, and it takes uh, a lot of energy, and it takes, uh, it, it just takes leaders as well. So Martin is a leader, he's doing his stuff. You all have to be leaders. So that's as much as I can say just today. So if there's any questions, um, it just gives you an insight into one community, which is loads and loads and loads of communities that are suffering and struggling. Do you know?